forward to getting some insight. Um, Logged as the office whisper and hybrid expert by the New York Times. Dr. Gleb Zaperski helps leaders uh, use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. He wrote his first book on returning to the office, uh, leading hybrid teams after the pandemic. His bestseller, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, as well as seven other books. His cutting edge thought leadership was featured in over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Fortune, and Forbes. His expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting for Fortune 500 companies, or, uh, from Aflac and Xerox to over 15 years in academia as a behavioral scientist at UNC Chapel Hill. And the Ohio State, the Ohio, I, I, I gotta make sure I put the Ohio State in there. Proud Ukrainian American, Dr. Gleb lives in Columbus, Ohio. Please well, welcome Dr. Gleb. And obviously your, your handout is, uh, is his book, so please uh, read it by before he's done. <laughs> <Your stars. Yeah. laughs> I'll be happy to sign it for anyone who wants after the presentation. <laughs> All right. So I just returned from the Midwest Staffing Conference. And they're definitely having a lot of struggles with any magic you are having as well, both internally, but with their clients. Their clients are asking them, what do I do? What do I do about this returning to office? What do I do about this hybrid work? How do I manage that? Give me some advice. And so that's what we'll be talking about. What kind of advice you can give them, and what kind of strategies can you implement within your own companies? Now, I'm going to start by thinking about how we think about this question. Now, imagine that after this break, you have an option, uh, you go out and you have an option of a couple of ice creams. And which of these ice creams sounds more preferable? Do you want an ice cream that's 90% fat-free, or one that's 10% fat-free? <laughs> so, who wants 90% fat-free? Right, for the majority, and 10% fat-free. <laughs> right. And, of course, as you noted, they are the same. Right? 90% fat-free means 10% fat. And 10% fat means 90% fat-free. Right? You see? But it's much more appealing to have 90% fat free, the large majority of us, than 10% fat. And that has to do with framing. How do we frame the question? How do we think about the question? So you really want to be thinking about any issue that you are trying to discuss and think about. How do you think about the issue? And how do others think about the issue? Whether it's employers or employees, how do they think about the issue? So this is called the framing. This is the concept, the cognitive bias, one of the somewhat flawed ways in which we think. Because the way that information is presented to us powerfully impacts how we perceive this information. But it's fundamentally important for us to understand. And so what are the frames around hybrid and remote work? Because different ways of presenting the same information will lead to really different outcomes. One is 90% percent that free and one is 10% percent back. We see that people have very different references, on average, about these two ways of creating the map. Now, the key thing for the people who are doing the hiring is that many, many, many of your contacts, employers, perceive hybrid work, perceive flexible work as a loss. That's their perception. That's their frame. They lost something. Else. They don't think of it as an opportunity. And so executives succeeded by leading in the office. And this loss of office-centric work is presented as a disruption of their success, of what is really important. There was a great article in Fortune recently about an executive who wrote how they lost their identity during the pandemic. We never completely returned to the office. How will I find it again? That's literally the headline of the Fortune article that the executive wrote. And Many, many of your clients have these emotions. They're not really being as rational about it as you might think they are. It's tied in identity politics. 
and we could use it into politics and political spectrum. But there's identity internal, how they feel. What their identity is around being a leader, being a boss, being in the office, and how they think about this issue. And they're ignoring or opposing disruption. We need to teach them it's not the solution. And that's what they're doing. Many of them are ignoring or opposing the disruption. The winners will be the ones who leverage disruption. We use it strategically to balance flexibility and control. So that's what I want you to be thinking about. How do you help the leaders you interact with? Hiring managers balance flexibility and control. So let's talk about the data and the errors. That's what we want to be thinking about. What's the data and what kind of errors are leaders making? That's the first part of the presentation. The second part of the presentation, we'll talk about some best practices that you can use to make better decisions and to help the leaders you interact with make better decisions around hybrid work and data. This is research from a bunch of great sources like. Gallup, Society for Human Resource Management, Harvard Business School, which don't have a stake in any particular outcome. It shows that over 85% of those who can work remotely want to do so a significant amount of the time. So at least have to work with something like that. And you know that well, at the Midwest Staffing Conference, at the Q&A, one of the people was more of a comment said that she was hiring for the same role. One person was hybrid, one person was fully office-centric. Same role, same company. The hybrid role, which was about half the work week, got 487 applications. The in-person one got 17. That's more than an order of magnitude difference. And over 90% of the people, when you think about minorities, and minorities have a stronger desire to be work remotely a significant amount of the time. So that is a DEI issue that what is going to be concerning to the employers you work with. Over 30% want full time remote work. That means that there's a golden middle. So something like 15% want full time office centric work, 30% around one full time remote work, but 55% want flexible hybrid. And that's an area in which there can be a lot of overlap between employers and employees if you frame it correctly and help them make good decisions. Now, there are some good reasons. Over 75% report better work-life balance and less stress when they can work a significant amount of time remotely, mainly because they don't have to do it. In New York, the commute is going to be over two hours. <laughs> and that's going to be a huge, huge time suck. Actually, there was a report that came out literally today that showed that, you know, I, mean, I just read it, 10 minutes before the presentation that showed that New York City has the largest loss of time due to commuting in the country, 331 hours. 331 hours, that, that is like half a month of your life just to spend commuting. So it's understandable why people don't want to do that in their better lives. Over 65% report being more engaged in their work if they have substantial opportunity for flexibility. Not full-time remote work, but over half the work. Over 70% are more likely to stay in their current job. So, issue, major issue of retention. So, about productivity. This is an issue that many, many people feel concerned about. What is the productivity implications of remote work? Elon Musk said that remote workers should tend to work elsewhere. So, he said that basically remote workers are not productive. And we see a lot of concern about productivity of remote work. In reality, when you look at remote work, people are willing to devote about half the time that they're not commuting, about 40 to 50% of the time that they're not commuting to their primary work. So it's actually, people are really willing to work more. We saw them working about 20 more hours <coughs> per month when they're working remote. And the Stanford University study said that remote work is actually improving in productivity. So remote workers who are 5% more productive in May 2020 that increased to 9% more productive in May 2022. Why? Because we learned how to work together better. We invested in technology tools, collaboration tools, Microsoft Teams, Slack. People learned how to lead in the remote settings better. There was investment in the utilities, for passive internet, investment in the home offices. So a lot of benefits that you need to be aware of. And that's the data. And you want to be presenting the data accurately to the employers with whom you work and who talk to your guys. And you want to be aware of what's in their minds. 
And one of the things that's going on is a cognitive bias called the status quo bias. <laughs> Cognitive biases, you might have heard of this term, these are dangerous judgment errors that stem from how our mind works. Our mind is actually not wired for the modern environment, it's wired for the Saran environment. We live in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. We have to survive based on the fight or flight reflex. And it was a really dangerous situation, so any change in the environment, which was very precarious, was going to be pretty dangerous for us. And so we want to get back to a status quo we see as good. So our minds are not well evolved the modern environment, which is full of disruptions. It helped our survival to favor the status quo back then, but in the modern world, that's a much, much worse approach. It comes with major opportunities. The disruptions that we face come with major opportunities. For example, AI. That's a major disruptor. Lots of conversations. Google just had a big, big meeting announcement about how they are trying to adapt to AI when they've been kind of left in the dust by open AI. And which is a small startup that nobody knew about until recently. And that's a major disruptor for an industry and for the world as a whole. The world of staffing will definitely be disrupted by the AI. But earlier, there were disruptions due to the pandemic, obviously, due to the fiscal crisis, due to the rise of smartphones. There were lots of disruptions. And we need to take advantage. These challenges, our intuition is to favor what we know. And there's, for example, Samsung banned the use of OpenAI, ChatGPT on their computers. That is not very smart. <laughs> At the very top level of the leadership team. Or the New York City, New York City banned the use of ChatGPT in schools. That's not very smart. You want to learn, teach students how to use these tools, not ban. They, they, they banned ChatGPT. There you go. Another not very smart the not very smart decision, right? It's banning tools that you're using. It's very important. So these things feel comfortable to us. And rejecting whatever feels uncomfortable to us is a strong intuition. We need to assess what's actually going to help us. If we fail to change when the world changes, we will be disrupted. 85% of talent prefer substantial remote work. And the more nimble, forward-looking companies love the heat. Those that don't give flexibility to their employees. Let's talk about another stance, another cognitive bias, solution of control. Mm -hmm. Solution of control. It's a greatly exaggerated sense of control. If we have leaders like Elon Musk, and perhaps some of the folks that you deal with, who have a strong sense of control when they see people, when those people are in front of them. But really, that's not a great approach. There's a good phrase that pride will be for destruction and a body spirit before a fall from the Bible. And this is really what's going on here. What percentage of time do you think employees actually spend working in the office? So you're staffing folks, you should know this. How much time do you think on average employees spend working when they're in the office? What does that show? 60%. 60%, okay. 70. 70. Anyone else? 40. Hmm? 40, okay, good. There you go. They actually work 36 to 39% of the time, depending on the study. These are observational studies. When they're in the office, when the boss passes by in the traditional management by walking around, they pretend to work. <laughs> but those who pretend to work in the office will also pretend to work at home. And those who pretend to work at home will pretend to work in the office. The data is really clear that remote work is actually more productive. It's much more productive on individual tasks it's more of a wash, slightly more productive on um, collaborative tasks. When, they're, when these are collaborative tasks that are asynchronous, it's quite a bit more productive. When it's synchronous, it's better to spend that time in the office. So, for most people. So, substantial cost savings. That is absolutely the case. Up to 12,000 for individual employees because they don't have to come in, the computing, clothing, and so on. They don't have to spend that money. So, it's a substantial cost savings. And, of course, employers save a lot of money, 11000 from office space and related services and expenses. A lot of savings from substantial remote. And so you need to understand what's going on with employees and employers. And the illusion of control is a powerful thing where people have too much of a tendency to manage by one another. And the final, functional fixing. 
You might have heard of the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when people <laughs> learn one way of functioning, they tend to adapt that to all other ways of functioning, to all other situations. So when you learn one way, you tend to become fixed in that. This is what you learn, this is what you know, this is what you're comfortable with. However, the context may be disruptive. And what was previously functional becomes dysfunctional. But people don't really notice when the context is disruptive. They don't change the way they function. They don't change the way they lead. They don't change the way they collaborate. They don't change the way they manage. And so the vast majority of organizations in April, May, 2020, March, transitioned from office-centric work to remote work. But they tended to use their office-centric methodologies for remote work. And that is not great. They never stopped to change the way they function and despite the disruptions that they face. So these are the three cognitive biases I want you to be aware of to really cause leaders to make some pretty bad decisions around hybrid work. Now, executives blame hybrid work for the loss of collaboration and innovation with these decisions. What is actually the cause is poor user experience. That's the real call. That comes from shoehorning hybrid and remote work into office-based work. So this is something to be aware of. Hosting Zoom happy hours is not a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> people laugh. Definitely, like, the forced socialization of Zoom happy hours has been shown to be disengaged. And we already knew that in late 2020. Mm -hmm. and some of the research showed that late 2020, that forced <coughs> socialization of virtual activities is disengaged. So not only do you waste people's time and therefore company money, but you have a blowback effect of the opposite of what you want of employee engagement. And you have forced socialization. And leaders still do this. I've seen, still seen Zoom happy hours. And the result, of course, is bad performance outcomes. It's not a one. And the solution is not to force employees to return to the office full time. That's a bad solution. We know that already. The solution with cognitive science and behavioral economics showing us example of forward-looking companies is to adopt best practices. You have UX customized to hybrid and remote. We want to maintain control while offering flexibility. So yeah. that is the best approach to the question. And we'll go, I'll get to your questions. So the next part will be part two, hybrid work best practices, but I'll be happy to take questions in part one right now, but we'll uh, starting with your name and one. Uh, Raj, my name Raj. is Raj Sundamani. The question is this hybrid work and remote work came some two years back when COVID uh, came into the picture. Yes. Before that, for like centuries, people were all going to office and there was no question of productivity, loss of productivity. Increase. So now, based on this two year interruption of the working model, why are we trying to justify this uh, hybrid uh, work model? So Why is there such an obsession about it? So it's not quite accurate to say that for centuries people went into the office. So the office was clearly on the downswing before. We had about 1% of workers working remotely around 2000. By the time the pandemic was 5%. So it was a five-fold increase over those two decades. And we had research already, quite a bit of research, showing that people worked more remotely. When they worked remotely, they were more effective on in their individual tasks and overall more productive. Collaboration somewhat suffered. But we have very clear research. My book talks about some citations if you want to look at that. There was a 2014 study at Stanford University which showed remote workers were about 8% more productive in the same company. 8%? 8%, yes. Is it, uh, is it too significant to uh, uh, go for that mark? 8% is not much. Not, not I don't know whether it's significant enough to go for it, but that's what the research shows. So it's not that saying whether you should do something or not. I'm saying what the research shows. There was a more recent study of Trip.com, which is a major travel agency, which assigned it was half of its staff to work full-time in the office, and another half of its staff to work in a hybrid model, coming into the office for about half the work or something like that. And these are people like programmers, these are people like marketers, HR people, mark designers, and so on, programmers. And they found that people who were working over six months the people who are working on a hybrid model had 
35% bed retention. That's over a third. Imagine that. <laughs> over a third better retention. And they were something like 9% more productive. Uh, well, they looked at specifically at programmers. Uh, they looked at others too, but that was more software productive. So programmers are all the, you know, something like 8 to 9% more lines of code, and which was accepted. So the same programmer in the office versus the programmer who was working in a hybrid model, the programmer wrote 8% more. And then there is another research I read about in the Time magazine mm -hmm. that says with remote work, people are moonlighting more. Mm -hmm. And they're doing two or three jobs, and they know, like, uh, where do you get the statistics 8% more to that? Well, we clearly observe that they are 8% more productive. Maybe they're also doing some side hustle. Yes. And that's it. But on their primary job, I mean, I'm telling you a study that Troop.com, a major company, ran. After that six month period, they said, well, don't want to waste more money. We're switching over everyone to a hybrid model. Because clearly, we're going to get more productivity, which they did, and, less, and better retention, which they did. So regardless of what the remote workers are doing in their separate time, they are being more productive for the company in their main activities and what they are actually working on. So it might be that the cost savings from the commuting is such, it might be the fact that they have better work-life balance, less stress, whatever it is. They're able to fit more activities into that type. Yes, what is your name? Uh, Artie Banks. Artie. Uh, I can understand how they can measure productivity with Many jobs, like from code. Some jobs are not measurable of objectively. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, in, in this study, uh, how did they measure productivity for those jobs that don't have metrics that are measured? So they measured it by the manager evaluations of performance and code. So they could measure very clearly the code, the programmers, and you should probably assume that other people are equally more productive, but the others were clearly more productive. But they, we couldn't actually measure them as uh, Jordan, sure. can you share some commentary on hybrid four-day work weeks? I know the studies in the UK, Iceland, a few sure. others. What have you seen in your research? So we see clearly that people have a stronger preference and more productivity when they have flexibility rather than just a four-day work. So people prefer to be able to work over seven days and do their work over seven days rather than squish it into four days. <coughs> four day work week in the office, a fully office centric, is better than a five day work week fully office centric. So when you think about those two comparisons. But the best outcomes come from the seven days. So, for example, the programmers in that study for trip.com that I talked about, we found a research study found that they extended their work all into the weekend. And clearly, based on people's <laughs> preferences, <laughs> what they do when given the flexibility, they don't squish their work into four days. They extend it into seven days. Hi, I'm Jim. Um, yes, Jim. I, I want to just, just focus, I just want to focus on productivity for a second. Yeah, sure. I get that people will work longer uh -huh. as they're giving up their com commute time. Yes. What I'm wondering is, did it look at roles that are very team-centric and figure out that they could be as productive not being connected. To give you an example, in our business, we frequently will have people sitting near each other and they'll have a job that they need someone to fill and they'll say, hey, what do you guys, what, Mary, what do you think of John? Would he be good for this, right? If you have to use Teams to call Mary and wait for her to answer, she might be on another call and then you don't get an answer. To get that immediacy of an answer, is not as easy. So I'm wondering how the productivity results that were showing how much more productive people were looked at these specific types of use cases where, for example, it's important for our industry. So and that's why I was mentioning the difference between collaborative versus individual work. So programmers do a lot of individual work. Right. When you look at their work, it's about 90-ish percent is from individual. And people who are do things like accounting they do a lot more individual work. Lawyers, and so on, many professional services, a lot more individual work. So individual work, when we look at what kind of work is best done at home, it's individual head down work, definitely better done at home. But all types of individual writing and so on, discussions. The other, other types of individual work that are better done at home is asynchronous communication. So it's Microsoft Teams, 
Slack messages, emails, and everything like that. And the final is video conference meetings and phone calls. Much better than a phone. Don't hurt. People, I'm actually doing a session for you know, mid-sized financial firm for helping their leadership decide about hybrid work versus remote work tomorrow morning. And uh, it's a half-day session. So what they're clearly finding, one of their challenges is that, and one of the reasons that people are reluctant to come in, is that when they come in and they're in their open office or their cubicles, they're having video conference calls. And they're distracted by people around them and is distracting for everyone around them. <laughs> so both kind of damage is done. So video conference calls and phone calls are better done remote. Things that are better done in the office are more intense forms of collaboration. Mentoring and on the job training, <coughs> socializing, and important conversations, whether it's implementing strategy from a leader to others, resolving conflicts, performance evaluation conversations. So those are really high value, high stakes activities, but they tend to occupy for most people less than twenty percent of the work. Of the no work. Or programmers even less. So it depends on your own. Yeah, so for that company, we're clearly going to do something like the traders, I mean, traders are going, and researchers are going to spend more time working remotely, and people who are admin roles, supporting roles, will spend more time at all the company. That's typically what I find with clients is going to be some of them break down their roles. <coughs> all right, so let's talk about best practices. Best practice is generally a hybrid first model for the large majority of the companies. It's a team led approach. So you don't set one top down decision making. Unlike Amazon, which said, come in for three days a week. These are the three days. That's a bad approach. We're very clear to see. <laughs> you want to very much push down decision making to the lowest level and let managers make. So for example, the recent contract negotiations that the Canadian government and the unions agreed on to have the managers make the decision on what's going to work for the team, it's pretty clearly the best model in the large majority. So having managers work with their teams to decide what works best for the team as a whole. Not the individual manager and the individual team member, but the team as a whole, as we talked about for the sake of team collaboration. So team leads collaborate with team members. And teams know best what they need. So they need to trust teams, and that's something that the managers who tend to micromanage have a lot of trouble doing. And letting go is very hard for managers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They need to let go and trust them. But their managers, that their middle managers, that C suite needs to let go and trust their middle managers will handle. And that's going to be a major part of my conversation tomorrow with the leadership team. They need to let go and trust that middle managers will handle. They'll, they'll be okay. The amount of time in each in the office for each team is based on the amount of collaboration. Most employees, like I said, come in for one day a week, one to two days maybe, because it's less than Less than 20% of their time is devoted to the kind of activities that are better done in the office. And you want to try to minimize commute time for your employees. If you want to maximize retention, minimize commute time. The less commuting they have to do, the better. So more than enough to cultivate trust and connections, very clearly. It retains a healthy culture, and a substantial minority, if you want to, can be all remote, so that depends on your company. So the companies that are more dependent on talent, that want to be able to source talent from anywhere, will have some people who are going to work remotely. But that should be a minority, because they, they're going to be people who are more indivi individual contributor roles. And you want to have team leads justify additional days in the office, so that there's going to be some old school team leads who are going to be micromanaging, and you want to have them justify those additional days. Now, Considering hybrid and remote work arrangements, what should we consider? What should we think about? You want to give people training. Offer training on these cognitive biases and the other best practices for hybrid and remote. Follow your remote options. What should, how should you communicate about this? Who is this good for? It's best for people who are productive, disciplined, self-starters when working remotely in those individual contributor roles. You need to be aware of potential career growth issues. We clearly have research that people who work full-time remotely are going to suffer in career growth on average. So this needs to be communicated. So you have a lot of 
employees, potential employees, recruits who want to work full time remotely. You need to communicate with all the remote staff there. You need to build social bonds and trust and plan group strategies. So these are team building retreats. And you should not only have them for the office staff. And one every quarter is a good balance. Now, virtual cohort. This is something that teams can use to collaborate effectively when they work remotely. So something that you talked about is how do you collaborate when working remotely. This is a good tool to do so. Virtual cohort. What you do is you join a video conference call. So this is for hybrid teams on the days that they're not in the office or for full remote teams. The microphones should be on. The speakers should be on. The video is going to be optional. So for people who are extroverted, they'll tend to leave their videos on. <coughs> and you'll be working on your individual tasks. But you'll have the opportunity to ask others questions. If anyone has, fun, has questions or wants to problem solve, turn on the microphone and ask. So question, you know, hey, Mary, can you help me with this candidate? Great opportunity to ask those questions. So I tend to see team members, including who, in staffing, who work remotely who use this technique, save the, their work on questions where they might need team members for this period of time, for about an hour. This is great for boosting collaboration, team bonding, social capital, and company culture, which is something that a lot of leaders are concerned about. So the virtual coworking is a really useful thing. It's especially helpful for getting junior staff members trained, bonded, mentored during this period of time. The teams should start once a week for an hour, and most teams do move to once a day because it's so hard. This is a great coworking technique for collaboration. Addressing proximity bias and burnout. You might have heard about these terms, proximity bias and burnout. Let's talk about what they are first. So proximity bias. It's a sense of envy by in-office workers for those who have more flexibility. And the opposite, a sense of worry about career issues by workers who are working part-time or full-time remote. The proximity bias refers to both those concepts. And uh, I have a Harvard Business Review article about this if you want to be more depth about it. So managers ignore or discount workers who are not present. We very clearly see that. So unless managers are specifically trained not to discount workers who are not present, they will tend to discount workers. It's human nature. So these are into boxes, tribals. So it causes anxiety and overwork among hybrid workers and remote workers, and that causes burnout. So it's going to be a problem in terms of burnout if you want to be aware. To address this, Culture of excellence from anywhere is very popular. What does that mean? You want to focus on outputs and deliverables, not inputs, not where you are. But addressing envy requires focusing on outcomes and deliverables. It's not about location, it's about confidence. So that's really key in addressing envy on both sides. To reduce burnout, you want to focus on what you do, not how, where you do. Your users overwork and anxiety that leads to burnout. This is really valuable, to have that focus on outcomes, not focus on where you work, how you do it. You want to trust. This is all about trust. So culture of excellence from anywhere is really about trust. Now, let's talk about performance management. You want to have performance management as part of this culture of excellence from anywhere that will not be the typical once a year annual performance evaluation. Instead, it will be frequent, small-scale evaluations of performance on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So small-scale performance evaluations, weekly one months, 30 minutes long. Great men, good managers, not even great ones, already do once a week meetings with their supervisees to figure out how things are going and so on. Now you'll just add a performance, now they'll just add a performance management element to it. So what that involves, first of all, is the benefits. Think about the benefits. It helps team members always know where they stand. It helps provide them with a psychological safety. So they're not going to get burned out. It improves retention and career growth. It prevents hybrid remote work causing overwork and burnout. Due to anxiety. Yes? Monty. Um, yes, Monty. Can you speak to how working hybrid or virtual affects raises and promotions? Yes, let me finish this point and then we'll talk about it. Thank you. Sure. So weekly one one and weekly goals in one one meetings. What do you want to do with this? Like how do you actually do it? The team, team member and the supervisor agree on three to five weekly goals at their one one meeting. 
And then 24 hours before the next one, one the team member sends a report on the activities to their supervisor. Their goal accomplishment, whatever problems they have that they solve, their self-evaluation, and then during the one-on-one -on -one training, their supervisor gives them some coaching that evaluates the performance, coaches on problem solving, affirms and revises their self-evaluation, and then together they set the goals for next week. That's how this approach works. Very effective approach. So integrating this performance management on a weekly basis. Mind to your question about raises. Well, one would imagine that if you can remember when everybody was in the office and you evaluated people on the day to day, yep. you could consider them for raises and or promotions because it was interaction. When someone is totally virtual, do you find that they still review the people for raises and promotions? Is it the same kind of procedure or what? No, not if you don't do use this methodology. So the typical they, that's where you get the proximity bias. That's the where the people who work in the office, they have better and faster career growth. Right. Whether it's raises, promotions, oh, assigning them responsible projects, they are remembered. So you have that proximity bias. So you definitely have people who don't have this sort of methodology. That's why I'm talking about this methodology. You need to have this to put hybrid and remote workers on an even basis. Because then you have, you, everyone knows where they stand, they know what their accomplishments are, they know what their goals are, they know what their solve, problems solve. And they always know what you said, and they know how close they are to promotions, raises, and so on. So if you don't, this is a solution for that problem. Thank you. Yep, that's a very simple advice. Okay, so I want to share with you about an example of someone who implemented this methodology. This is the director of a 400 people AI and information sciences institute, so you can imagine how busy <laughs> they are with the passion about AI right now, working at the University of Southern California. Yeah. This is Information Science Institute. His name is Dr. Craig Nobla, and he'll tell you about implementing this hybrid first model. Uh, when the first key came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought, that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message that Okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then you know work from home two days a week, uh, and and then I saw a video that Lev actually a video talk that Lev actually gave back to me uh, that really actually changed my mind about this, and it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it, and uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for the web and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I, I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be uh, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the uh, Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with both club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work rates. If you want to learn more about them, they just had a New York Times article featuring the exceptional hybrid work. Yes, your name? My, name, my name is Carter. Carter. I guess my concern is if we're dealing with clients or people in our own office, if the needs change, and especially in this environment when you're hiring people and you either put in remote, hybrid, and now things change or based upon projects, based upon management styles, based upon what multiple areas. What you might have thought was a three-day work week, or you wanted somebody in two days, and now you need that person to come in four days. That person has been hired, and they want an impression they're going to work one day or two days, and now you ask them to come in four or five. That creates problems, Absolutely. and the legal aspect of that. So how do you address or feel we should be dealing with this from a policy standpoint, from what we're putting in policies, procedures, documentation, job descriptions, related to expectations? I think you need to put in exactly that, that the current situation in this company is two days 
in the office three days out of the office. But they are they have an experimental approach and they're revising their modality, so they might very well change it to be either less or more time. So people need to have that expectation, need to make it upfront. So for example, the Information Science Institute, they put it on their, on their website. They have a flexible hybrid model. That's kind of a pretty public commitment. Mm -hmm. So it's going, not all companies do that, right? They have much more of a, you know, a little bit more wishy-washy, a little bit less certain. We're going to explore, we're going to experiment. The hires, which are helping hire, need to know that. And they need to know what's going on with the company and how firm they are. So they, that will help address these problems. It will lead to some less hires because people want certainty. But you can't promise them that. And you'll have more long-term damage to yourself if you promise them certainty and you have guarantees. Yes. Hi, Kate. I have a question What is the data show about gender differences in hybrid? Sure. Great question. So I usually talk about this in my three-hour presentation. So gender differences are only <laughs> <laughs> uh, women generally definitely want more flexible work. So, for example, the conference board survey, a survey by the conference board showed that about 39% of men really value flexibility, uh, like full time flexibility, full flexibility in their work. 50% of women really value the full flexibility in their work. And we have lots of similar surveys that show that women have a much stronger desire for more flexibility. And clearly, a large part of this is due to, unfortunately, women still being responsible for the majority of child care, elder care, home chores, and other things like this. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah. So what do you see about the intergenerational workforce? Like, we have four generations in our workforce. It's, it's so tricky. what I, I've actually heard at other conferences, yeah. people say, well, my generation had to suck it up, so their generation <laughs> has to suck it up. So I, yeah, so I'm this is a very tricky you, question yeah. because we have, it's nuanced. It's not tricky in terms of data, but it's tricky in terms of there's no sound. Effect. We very clearly see that baby boomers have the least desire among all for flexibility. And then we have Gen X having somewhat more desire. But then a surprising finding is that millennials have the most desire. And then Gen Z has less desire than millennials, but more desire than Gen X. So it's kind of like, low, low, high, moderate, so to speak. And so it's, it's not a sound bite. It's not like the youngest people want the most flexible work. It's something that many people don't always, it's not the youngest people don't want the most, the most full time development. They, a lot of young people know that they need to come to the office to get more mentoring, to get more like, coaching and new job training. We do see that the thing that does happen is that Gen, that Gen Z has the least desire for full time in office work. So if they're asked to come in full time in the office, then that the, then the curve is you know, in, in the typical modality that we would think that you know, Gen Z has the least desire for full time in the office with the millennials, Gen X. And um, what's your, have there been any studies about productivity? What's your name? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Nate. Nate. Um, have there been any studies about this productivity when we're remote or hybrid relative to the, the pay bracket? What I'm thinking specifically is we hired someone who is young and paid little, so she didn't have her own room. Mm -hmm. Quite literally, her mother would ask her if she was taking the dog out for a walk during the mm -hmm. But I didn't know if there's any research, you know, sort of trying to correlate the productivity of whether they can afford to have their own office at home or not. So it's not about affordance. It's usually about young people. So one of the other reasons that young people, less important but secondary reason that young people want to come to the office more often is because it's less often the case they have a good home office. So it has to do much more with age than with uh, their impact. Okay. Hi, Brad. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any research or data around mental health in working from home, like feelings of isolationism, I guess, or sure. how does that back into it? So I mentioned earlier in the early part about the data that 75% of the people have better well-being, including mental health on average when working from home. With isolation and social connections in particular, we definitely see that people are more socially isolated from their coworkers when they work from home. But according to a research survey by Cisco, the 74% of people responded to report having more connection with friends, with family, and over 50% report having more connection with friends. So they're not socially isolated as a whole, they're more socially isolated from their coworkers. 
this remote work is impacting team building, problem solving, and uh, quick training. Because especially in the evolving technological scenario, you should be able to bring those 10 people together in a room and do some quick training for one hour course. Whereas this remote work is coming in the way. Absolutely right. Yeah, that's why I mentioned the best things to do in the office are training, especially more intense training, so the collaborative training, team building, collaboration, those are definitely better done now. And problem solving. Problem solving, solving, it depends on the kind of problem solving. So if it's a problem that needs more long term thought, with asynchronous, that's in some ways better done at home. When people aren't distracted, they can focus on it. If it's a problem that benefits from short term brainstorming problem solving, it's better done at home. So the if there is a difficult customer we want to tackle, mm -hmm. we get all the team leads together quickly and then find a common solution. Yeah, but for that, it's definitely going to be better. To and uh, then when people are remote, you know, this is becoming very cumbersome. Absolutely. Yeah, for that sort of, but if you want to think about launching a new product, which requires a lot more thought and planning and market research, a lot of that is better done at home. So it depends on the kind of problem you want to solve. One, two, three, and then to another conclusion. Do you have any specific Your name? My name is Carol. Do you have any specific suggestions for translating all of this to a smaller work environment? So I am a team of you know, people. Sure. So I can't push decisions down to my sure. manager. I am the manager. Right. So any any specific suggestions for best practices in that scenario? So the virtual co-working definitely mm -hmm. want to do. And I would recommend the performance management evaluations, the small scale, once a week performance evaluations. Mm -hmm. So you probably meet with them occasionally one on ones anyway. And this was just structured and include a performance element to it. And I can guarantee to you that the people who did do this in your own found a lot of benefit. Hi, Erica. I, I, yeah. I don't know if this is a fair question, it's not really about remote work, but I'm curious if in any of your research you um, look at productivity for no meeting days for your literally blocking yourself to do uninterrupted work and impact the productivity. Yeah, let me answer the underlying question. Uh, so the underlying question is kind of meetings, how do you communicate and collaborate effectively? What we see works best is if you push as much communication and collaboration to asynchronous time as possible. So the phrase, this could have been an email, is definitely true. There's, the research does show that if you can do something, communicate, if you want to communicate your voice, for example, and your expression, send a voice memo or a video of email. So don't think of a meeting where people are spending their time when they don't meet. Meetings are, like Raj is talking about, for problem solving, brainstorming. These are the sorts of things that they couldn't have in an email. <laughs> do you have any recommendations name? of what should be included in a hiring process for a that's one of the things that I, we deal with. We have two days mandatory in the yep. office and some uh, managers and trainees, three days. But there's there's a lot that has to go into the policies yep. with regard to dress code, and because we're in the staffing business and we're interviewing people to go on interviews. We sure. have to be dressed in a certain way. And I find that I am much more into having to be the um, police in terms of, you know, this one on this call does not look like they're ready to work today. Mm -hmm. And this creates so much anxiety sure. in the fact that, are they going to do Zoom interviews looking like this? <laughs> so there's a lot of elements here. There's a lot of balls in the air on yeah. hybrid. What, what do you think should be included in your policy that you're going to put out there to create this atmosphere of getting the best collaboration as well as getting the most productivity? It's hard to answer that question generally. So what I find when I work with clients generally about the research is it really depends on your business model, what you're doing. So for example, in finance, you really want to look sharp on video. In tech, you don't want to look sharp on video. <laughs> so it depends on the specific industry and even, to some extent even the culture. If it's going to be an innovative startup in tech versus is it going to be, I don't know, Oracle. Oracle will generally have more formal attire than an innovative style. So it depends on the size and depends on the industry. But you want to communicate to your employees, potential to your recruits, potential staffers, what the policy, what they should anticipate about the company. 
this can be dangerous to dress up. So if you're going to interview for a tech interview, for example, so you want to be thinking about what is the culture of the company like and what would they expect. The last question. Sure. Um, has, has it affected wages to the extent where over the pandemic you had individuals that were living in New York City as an example, right? And they moved to Florida. They want to keep their same wage, they want to keep their same job, you know, the same characteristics of what they enjoyed in New York, so to speak, in terms of their lifestyle. Um, what, what, what have you seen over the last three years? I mean, the impact that you see going forward as companies look at that and say, you know what, I'm not paying you that wage to live in Idaho, right? Or in the mountains somewhere, I, you know, I need you here, <laughs> um, at least in the general area. Your intuition is actually very right. The National Bureau of Economic Research put out a paper showing that inflation has been pressed down by 2.5% due to remote work because people are willing to accept lower wages to live where they want to live. So the flexibility, people really value that, so they're willing to accept less money. So definitely the case that you pay less for remote workers. Can I ask one last question? Quickly. Uh, the remote work has been impacting the economy, the general economy. Yep. Uh, right now in New York, for 50% of the buildings are waiting. Yep. You know, that has had a dragging effect on the sure. local economy, uh, national economy. Uh, do you have a solution for that? Well, so definitely it's been dragging down buildings in New York, but it's been dragging up buildings in the suburbs. So the national economy assumption is not good. I'm sorry, Rush. So it's been actually, there's winners and losers, and whatever people are, that's the winner. Whatever people are, that's the loser. But the people are still in the United States. <laughs> so overall, it balances out, because just the, the downtowns are the losers, and the suburbs and the exurbs are the winners. But they work from home. They don't move to an office. Oh, sure. No, 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 they do. We definitely see people going to WeWork. We definitely people see going people to ordering out from DoorDash or you know, their home office. Yeah, wherever people are, they spend money. So they need to get their dry clean done, whatever they're doing. So they spend money in the exurb of the suburbs, whatever they didn't spend in the downtown homes. All right, let's finish up. Maintaining control while offering flexibility. This is what you want to be thinking about. You will now have the science-based tools to get ahead of the competition to help your clients and success, have success in hybrid and remote work by maintaining control while still offering flexibility. My book will help you do so. So you all have a copy of my book in front of you. I'll be happy to sign it for anyone who wants afterwards. You need to defeat cognitive biases. So don't forget that. We talked about that in the beginning. We talked about the framing effect, the status quo bias, the illusion of control, and functional fixes. And help your team adopt best practices for remote and hybrid work, best use practices. Hybrid first team led model, what Craig talked about, collaboration with virtual co-working, proximity bias, and addressing burnout, culture of excellence from anywhere, and personal performance management. How do you get that? Weekly one-to-one -one performance evaluations. Now go out, help your teams get ahead of the competition in the future of work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. Um, you know, it still obviously got to be a very, very complex solution. Um, and a lot of work that we're, we're all going to have to do to make sure that we're coming up with the right solution for our organizations. But uh, again, thank you so much.